Hello and welcome. Uh, this is uh, Ken Sebastian. I'm a vice chair at RBC, and it is with great pleasure uh, that we wanted to uh, welcome Merck Procuritis and Niall Rogers. Let me ask you guys both a question. You know the third year anniversary of song. Uh, spend a little bit of time talking about your thesis for the business, and just to discuss between the two of you as you started the bit, started this endeavor and the opportunities you guys see and have seen over the last three years in, uh, for hypnosis music. Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you uh, for having us, Kent. Um, and hello, everyone out there. Um, you know, when we started the song, when we started hypnosis, there were really two aspects of this. One was that, um, you know, we felt that the songwriter was delivering the most important component to an artist having a hit. The song is, after all, the currency of our business. Yet the songwriter was the low man or woman on the totem pole um, in terms of getting paid. And we wanted to change that system. Um, and, uh, you know, concurrent with that, streaming was starting to take hold after 16 years of technological disruption in this space where people could con you know, effectively consume music for free, um, you know, that was technology that almost killed the music industry and left these songs at very attractive prices was evolving into uh, uh, streaming. And, you know, streaming was very, very clear to both Niall and I was going to blow the pie up all over again. Um, and, you know, we just started riffing on this idea of let's take songs and turn them into an asset class and then use the power of that asset class to then leverage how songwriters are paid. So it was a, a serendipitous situation where we could basically create, you know, go to the biggest institutional investors in the world, demonstrate for them that songs had, particularly proven songs, had very predictable and reliable income that it was also uncorrelated um, and you know, because people are consuming music whether times are good or bad and that uh, uh, you know, in the context of streaming blowing the pie up, we could take these assets that were available at very attractive prices and really have a, a, a driver that was gonna increase the earnings in the future and make for a very investable case. Um, I'll let Niall get into it from there, but but you know that was the core thesis was that these songs are available at attractive prices. Streaming is going to blow the pie up. We're going to do a better job of actively managing them. Things like the copyright board ruling are going to take place that that will give the songwriters a bigger share of the pie, and that we can bring efficiency to the collection. And you know that made you know made for a very solid investment case. Yeah, it's you, you know when you, when you think about it, um, the the part of the business that's always been um, uh, let me just take you back. I'm not, let me start again. So when I got signed, uh, it wasn't because I was a really good guitar player um, or my band was cool or anything like that. It was also because that I wrote the songs. So. I had a, a good income from writing songs, but I had a more substantial income from uh, from live performances. We, you know, when we had hit records, we would go out and we'd perform. So it was, uh, we didn't sort of make that big of a deal out of uh, <laughs> not getting really paid what we believe we should be getting paid uh, because, uh, we just love the opportunity to be in the music business. Uh, you know, having the situation be what it is now, the pandemic has really made it clear to a lot of artists that um, the house that we built as songwriters um, is not being uh, fair to us at all. I mean, it's really, it's really out of balance. And now is the time especially because we can see the long tail of, of hit songs. Um, now is the time to really start to focus on trying to get this better, make it more equitable. You know, what Niall is describing is, you know, there's a, a post-Beatles paradigm 
where 90% of the artists between 1962 and, you know, 10 years ago, right, a, a good, you know, sort of 40 to 50 year period, you know, the artists wrote their own songs yeah. and they were, they were self-contained. So you didn't, you know, you didn't notice the discrepancy or the disparity, you know, between uh, what the songwriter was being paid and what the record company was taking and paying the artist. Today, 90% of the artists that are being signed are people that are reliant on outside songwriters for their hits. So there, there actually hasn't been a Billboard Top 100 album of the year since 2014 that didn't have an outside songwriter on it. So now you've got a guy like, you know, Ryan Tedder, you know, writes a song for the Jonas Brothers. It's the biggest song of the summer of 2019, Sucker. The Jonas Brothers get to go out and play for a million dollars a night, and Ryan Tedder is still getting his measly, you know, songwriting royalty. <laughs> so that that disparity is, is is has never been more amplified than it is today, and we wanted to change that. And as I say, we you know we thought that that there was a great investment case for songs that would not only be something that would be a great. Uh, give our shareholders a great return on their investment and build a very, very strong company, but also be something that then would give us the leverage to be a catalyst for changing the system of how the songwriters paid. What, one, one question for both of you. I know we spend a lot of time in, in, in certainly folks in the audience are well aware of the growth of streaming and again i think there's obviously lots of research out there saying it's going to double from 400 million subscribers to 800 million over the next five years there's obviously the creation of new formats whether social media exercise smart speakers live stream and others and certainly all of those things are going to lead to the growth of the publishing market um you know from about 10 billion or so to about 15 billion or so over the next five years but as you guys look at the business on the publishing side over the next handful of years, how much, how important is international as you both think about it? And, and, where, and do you see growth even beyond some of these generally thought of, you know, metrics uh, as we think about projections for the size of the market? So the, the, the first thing to say there is, is even before you get to international, the thing that's really important to take note is that in a streaming paradigm, a streaming paradigm, music has gone from being a discretionary or luxury purchase to now being a utility purchase. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, the, the business that Niall and I grew up in, we dreamed about one thing, platinum records, right? <laughs> you know, were you gonna, you know, was your record gonna be a platinum record? And, and put that in context, in the United States, a platinum record, a million copies. So, you know, if you sold a million records in a country that had 360 million people in it, you were having extraordinary success. And, you know, that number immediately, that, that ratio, one in 360, immediately tells you that the average person, albeit they might love music, didn't love it enough to put their hand in their pocket and pull out 15 bucks and pay for it, right? They were happy to listen to it on the radio for free or to see it on television. So that's the old paradigm. The, the new paradigm is that we now have 100 million homes in the United States that are paying $10 a month for a premium music subscription. So, you know, 100 million homes that are contributing $120 a, a year to to our business. So we've now gone from a, a model that was one in 360 to one in less than four, right? So that's that's really the, the critical aspect of it. And of course, that's also having a, that certainty of earnings, uh, certainty of revenue is also having a massive effect on how our catalogs are valued. You know, so the discount rates that are used for how these catalogs are valued are narrowing dramatically, um, you know, because there's a certainty of, 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 of income and, and, you know, no risk in, 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 in the investment. Um, when you then that, and, and of course, crucially, none of those people are in the data on which we buy these catalogs, 
right? They're, they're, not the, they're not the people that drove that income before. Now, if you go to these big emerging markets that you're talking about, Africa, China, India, where, you know, ultimately, you know, you've got the biggest part of the world's population. And all of those markets were previously, you know, illicit markets, markets where you'd go to the local bodega and pay a dollar or two and get the bootleg CD, not buy the real CD, right? And now instead of giving that dollar or two to the local bodega, they're, they've got smartphones and they're buying, um, uh, uh, you know, streaming services with it. So the interesting thing for me is that when you look at Spotify's move from a few weeks ago, where they opened in 60 odd other countries, Apple did that last summer, almost the same thing. You know, you can be Nile and, you know, think about Nile's track record, right? All the great Sheik songs, great Diana Ross songs, great Sister Sledge songs, great David Bowie songs, great Madonna songs, great Duran Duran songs, you know, great Stevie Ray Vaughan songs, great Daft Punk songs, and on and on and on. None of that stuff in the last 40 years has ever received a check from Senegal or the Congo or India or, you know, uh, China. And now checks are rolling in from those places. Right. So, you know, we're getting checks on on everybody dance and the freak and good times. And that's that's the first time in, a, in you know, one of the most successful careers ever in music. The first time in 45 years, money is coming from these other places. And it's the same thing for Neil Young and it's the same thing for Fleetwood Mac and all of these other wonderful you know catalogs that we own. Yeah, I think. One of the things, and, and, and this is kind of a question with Niall, one of the things that, Merck, as you know, uh, I actually have a passion for content creators and content ownership. And I thought that what you both were doing when you took the business public into a permanent structure that allowed the marketplace and the public to own a share of these kinds of marquee, uh, legendary, culturally relevant songs was incredibly important versus oftentimes in the financial community we own it just as purely financial assets you both are in the business and i want you know now you think about where you guys have come from i know you're out speaking to artists every day how do the artists approach this i mean they obviously having a permanent vehicle is where you guys own it they get to see it every day they know you're caring for it how do the artists think about it as you approach them and have conversations so what I've seen and what I've felt is that we really feel like a family. Uh, all the artists are extremely happy. Uh, the, we, we can show them that it's the first time in their lives that they are seeing revenue from sources that they've never seen before. And that we also, um, Merck likes to say, and, and I love this concept, that we actually manage the songs. So you can see that um, we, you know, we just don't go for every deal that's offered to us. We turn down a lot of licensing deals. I mean, I, I'm a little different because the, I have an artistic take on it. Uh, artistically, I believe that that creators, um, if they they want to license my music and they want to do things with it, I believe that. Who am I to say that artistically it's not valid? Um, so I almost license every single thing that comes to me because, I mean, what would I have said uh, <laughs> to the Sugar Hill Gang if I, if I had said no? I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, there, there would be no rapper's delight. I mean, we, you know, uh, obviously I said no at the beginning because I didn't even know about it until, <laughs> until the record was already out. But you, you know what I'm saying? Figuratively uh, speaking, that that's, that's just how I feel. However, Merck has a different um, viewpoint and I understand where he's coming from because to artists, these songs are like our children. They are really, uh, they're, they're incredibly important to us. When we create this magic, and, and it is magic because you have no idea how sometimes you toil and toil and toil over a record toil and toil over a song and then other times you can write it in 20 minutes and it's amazing you never really know but the passion uh that you have for this creation is um it, it's it's for the rest of your life 
And I think that what winds up, what the artists feel is that they certainly understand Merck's passion. And of course they understand mine. I work with most of them. Uh, so they get where I'm coming from. Uh, and it's, it's just been, I have to say that we haven't really had any rocky relationships. We haven't had any negative feedback. Now, you know, I, I like to look at the world in a very rosy uh, way, um, which is what keeps me going. Uh, Merck might differ with that a little bit, but I, I really believe that uh, from all the relationships that we have, all of the interaction that we've had with people, it's just been wonderful and they really get where we're coming from. And also to think in terms of their music as a viable asset class is, is amazing to them when they are edified and they start to see that this is important to others to invest in, that it's a, it's a matter of pride to people. Hey, we yeah. had, yeah, go ahead, Mark. Sorry, Ken, I was gonna say, we, you know, we had three uh, objectives when we started. The first was to establish songs as an asset class that could rival gold or oil. Um, and we recognized that doing that wasn't just going to be good for hypnosis. It was going to be good for every songwriter that had their songs, as well as you know the other companies that 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 uh, uh, were in the same business as we were. We were actually doing a lot of other companies a service by being a public company, by going from being a normal listing on the London Stock Exchange to then becoming a premier listing to then becoming a FTSE 250 company and then subsequently one of the biggest yielders on the index. Um, but, you know, ultimately, you know, that was step number one was to establish songs as an asset class. The second step, which is a much longer uh, process, is to change what songwriter sits in the economic equation. And then the third step was to destroy what we considered to be this archaic, broken publishing model where the big companies are focused on, you know, they've got 20,000 songs per person and their focus is creating new IP, not being focused on the classic songs that are already, you know, what the public knows and loves. And yet, and, and, and those, the, the passive income from those songs underwrites the new IP business, but in general, those classic songs are allowed to languish. So, you know, when you've got 20,000 songs per person, they can only take income and requests. It's like, you know, we want to use this in a movie or, or whatever. You say yes or no to it. But no one's ever going out there trying to create opportunities for those songs. That's what we do differently. We go out and try and create opportunities for the songs and we add huge value based on, on the model that we bought the songs and we're adding huge value for our shareholders by putting that time and effort in. But, but what I wanted to say, though, is that, you know, these songs are, are a part of the fabric of society, right? When the song hits, so if you were, you know, if you were a, a, a you know, I don't know, a, a 14 year old girl in 1977, 78, when, um, you know, I Want Your Love or La Freak or Everybody Dance came out and were number one singles, you know, you're now a 60 odd year old woman and, you know, you're, you're you know, or thereabouts, and this song's been a part of the fabric of your life ever since. It's seen you through good times, it's seen you through bad times, and it'll continue to be a part of your life for the rest of your life, and chances are that you've also passed it down to your children and your grandchildren and everything else, and now it's a part of the fabric of their lives. So it's incredible that, you know, like Niall tells this great story about writing Everybody Dance, the first song that he ever wrote, I guess, you know, for me, I think we should let some of the people that are listening hear a couple of these stories because, you know, how these great songs that become a part of the fabric of our society is quite fascinating. So, so I was um, uh, a jazz snob when I was younger and I was taking lessons from one of the greatest musicians I'd ever met. I was studying under Billy Taylor and, you know, the whole jazz mobile uh, system. And um, uh, and one day I went for my lesson and I had a sort of sourpuss look on my face. And that's not who I am. I'm a very happy-go-lucky guy. 
And my teacher said to me, hey, Niall, you know, wh what's wrong? And I, and I had the set list of the gig that I was doing that night. And, you know, when you're a working musician, you, you do. Uh, fortunately, I was lucky enough to be able to do almost any job that I was hired for um, or any job that I auditioned for. So I was doing uh, club dates. And this particular night, I was doing a pop club date. And the lead song on the set was Sugar Sugar by the Archies. And I said to my teacher, I said, man, you know, I can't believe I got to play this BS pop stuff tonight. Because, you know, I wanted to impress my teacher and say, you know, like, you know, I'm playing straight ahead music all the time. And, and he looked at me and he says, what do you mean BS pop stuff? Now, this is a person who's never had a hit record in his life and never, ever did. Uh, he's since passed away. But... Um, and I, I said, well, look, I, you know, I start my set with Sugar Sugar by the Archies. And he said, no, nah, do you know that song's been number one for about three weeks? And I said, yeah. And he said, so let me make sure I understand you. So you're saying those millions of people who love Sugar Sugar are wrong, but you, Nile Rogers, you, Mr. Jazz, are right? And I thought, no, nah, what is he trying to explain to me right now? He said, let me tell you something now. And now you got to go back to the way things used to be. Uh, if you had a record in the top 40 when I was a kid, chances are you saw that gold insignia next to that record. Almost any record that was in the top 40 had sold a million copies. So he said to me, he said, you know, Niall, any record that's in the top 40 is a great composition. And I said, a great composition. You call Sugar Sugar a great composition? He said, absolutely. And I said, why would you say something like that? And he said to me, because it speaks to the souls of a million strangers. I'm almost going to cry when I say this. Um, and when I heard him say that, it changed my life. And I thought to myself, as an artist, what do I want to do? I want to talk to people that I've never met before. I want them to feel what's inside me. Two weeks later, I wrote a song called Everybody Dance, Do 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 Do, Clap Your Hands. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest was history. <laughs> and the rest was history. That went, on, that went on to cause a stir in the underground clubs in New York. And a few months later, Chic was signed as a group, and we came out with our first single, Dance, Dance, Dance. <laughs> yowza, yowza, yowza. <laughs> But you know, the, the hypnosis catalog is is sixty thousand songs that speak to the souls of a thousand of a million strangers. Right. You know, that's exactly what, what the catalog is. Is is you know, there's I mean, there's four thousand number one songs. There's fifteen thousand top ten songs. I think it's thirty five thousand top forty songs. You know, it's it's you know from from everybody dance and the free. You know, The Freak is the greatest selling single in the history of Atlantic Records, one of the most storied record company, Good Times, one of the most interpolated songs of all time. But whether it's Journeys Don't Stop Believing or, you know, Bon Jovi's Living on a Prayer or The Eurythmic Sweet Dreams Are Made of This, these are all songs that, that you know, exactly what Miles was talking about, songs that speak to the, the souls of a million strangers. Hey, hey Niall, because we're going to, we're going to run out of time. Let me ask you one question real quick, and then I'll ask you for one more follow-up. Uh, what do you think in terms of uh, return to live concerts? You're a performer, uh, probably a massive part of what you do still, despite the value of publishing. You, you, you love to perform. What's your view on that coming out of this? When do you think we'll start to see performances and I, I I have no idea. I'm the worst person uh, when it comes to predictions because I'm always optimistic. I, I want a gig tonight. Um, but um, as you well know, I'm very, uh, I'm, you know, really responsible yep. and safe. And, and I've had, you know, both my vaccinations and all that. But the truth is, is that, you know, I won't get on a plane. I won't go do a show. I won't do anything unless it's, um, unless it's safe, because it's not just me that I'm thinking about. It's the rest of the band and the people at the show. Um, so I just hope that, you know, that the world comes together and gets this under control as soon as possible. But um, uh, I, I think that it, it's, it's, it's sort of reckless to do concerts 
um, in an environment that's not really safe. I mean, yep. you know, I, I've actually had a lot of friends that have passed away. I won't say a lot, but you know, more than than should have passed away from COVID, and that's it, it's horrible. One one last thing, and, and look, those are great comments. Uh, uh, one last question for for both of you. You know, obviously, we've been through a tumultuous year, and obviously, Niall, you and Merck, both in particular, have spent a lot of time on the Black community, and certainly the legacy of the Black community, and the importance of the Black community in music. What are some of the things you guys are both doing, just as you think about um, the, the, the year that's passed, and as we look forward? How, how do both of you think about the importance of the community to um, to your business, as well as just broadly speaking to, to the music industry? <laughs> it's, it, I mean, black music is the music industry right now. I mean, you, you know, uh, it's ever since, you know, they, ever since we started recording music, yeah. uh, it's been a substantial part of, of the business. And, and I have to say that, uh, you know, unfortunately, it's always been sort of a, a, a microcosm of society. My first record cost $3,500 to make, and my first album was $35,000. I know friends of mine that were white bands that got signed. They had, you know, you know half million dollar deals and things like that, you know, would have three albums and never have a hit. Uh, I was signed to a singles deal. I had to have a hit. My first record had to speak to the souls of a million strangers. I would have never gotten an album deal. So I, I know that, that Merck and I, we talk about music all the time. And I am so passionate about um, trying to uh, have, you know, the playing field be fair and equitable. And I know that at least when we get to that that tipping point with the with, uh, hypnosis, we will certainly, um, you know, <laughs> be the vanguard of um, we, uh, of that movement. I mean, we, you know, we are, I guess what I would say is this, you know, going back to what Niall was saying is, you know, even before, you know, the, the, the Niall's generation, you know, if you go back to Elvis, he's singing Arthur Big Boy Crudup songs. The Beatles start singing Chuck Berry's, you know, start start out with, you know, Chuck Berry records and Little Richard records. The Rolling Stones start out with Bobby Womack records. You know, Motown hits at the same time. You know, black music has been making the world go round for, you know, 60, 70 years now. And what's important to hypnosis is that, you know, and we have, you know, probably almost 50% of our catalogs are catalogs written by people of color. And we believe that in 2021, that any company that is in business, you know, it's not enough to say Black Lives Matter or to, you know, say the right things. You also have to do the right thing. So we believe that it's critically important that any company actually in its actions reflect the values of the people that it makes money with and from, right? So, so our views, you know, are, are very much based on what's in the best interest of the black community because we would be irresponsible and hypocritical. And, and I'm tired of seeing these big corporations that make money off of the black community, but yet vote for, you know, someone that is, you know, doesn't have the best interest of in the black community at heart. So, you know, in our, you know, just to give an example, when Ahmaud Arbery was murdered um, and two months later, nothing had been done, despite the fact that the events of the murder were clear on television on a nightly basis, Niall and I spoke with all of our songwriters that were in Georgia, all of whom were people of color, and we wrote a letter to the district attorney of Liberty County and we just said, listen, you need to know that we've spent $150 million in Georgia in the last 18 months. The people that we've spent that money on are all taxpayers. They're all high rollers that put an awful lot of money into the economy. 
they're the biggest songwriters in the world. They write songs for Beyonce, Rihanna, Madonna, Jay-Z, Kanye West, Mariah Carey, et cetera, et cetera. They have very loud voices and they're gonna use those voices unless you do something about this. And within a few days, we had a letter back from them, an email back from them, not saying anything other than acknowledging that they received our email with everyone on it as a signatory. And then two days later, Ahmaud Arbery uh, murderers, the first, the first two of the three were arrested. Now, I don't know whether we were a catalyst for that or not, but what I know is that what we did was absolutely the right thing to do. And it's what I would expect any business that makes its money with and from the black community to do. And it's, it's you know, I, I did an interview on British television earlier um, today with Richard Branson to abolish the death penalty. Um, and the point for me is very simple. There are, you know, more black people on death row um, by about 99 to one than any other race. Um, it's been proven over the last few years that um, most of the people that are on death row, there have been tons of people that have been exonerated. Sadly, many of them after they've passed, after their life have been taken from them. Um, and therefore, it's not, you know, it's, 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 it's cruel, it's inhumane, and it's not safe because what we've learned is that the police are, are prepared to arrest black people based on the color of their skin, not based on the merits of, 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 of what's taken place. So you just have to be responsible. And, and, you know, this is something that has to be a part of the culture of our company and a part of our lives, not just last June, but literally for the rest of our lives if we're going to change this system. I agree. Well, I, I think we're running out of time. I want to thank both of you. This was fantastic. And, and Niall certainly wins the best background award, I'm sure, <laughs> of the session. Um, so thank you both. And we deeply appreciate it. We're looking forward to the next five years and longer uh, for hypnosis. Uh, certainly we expect to see massive things out of you all and think it's going to be one of the great stories over the next a handful of years and longer. So thank you both. Thank you. It's a pleasure, Ken. Thank you so much. Yep. This content is based on information available at the time it was recorded and is for informational purposes only. It is not an offer to buy or sell or a solicitation, and no recommendations are implied. It is outside the scope of this communication to consider whether it is suitable for you and your financial objectives.